Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Did you do a bracket? Are you March Madness no, guy? No, no. Once the better players started playing zero to one years of college basketball, I lost a little bit of a lure for me. Yeah, I, I love it. I don't watch a singular regular season game, so I don't care. So I the can't really even bore the listeners with the take. But look, the, the, the problem with this one is like a casual college basketball fan. The only college basketball content I've consumed before this tournament is about the number of Alabama basketball players were like president of like a horrible murder. Mm, yeah, that was a um, story. And, and some of them are playing in the, I mean, I, this is a fairly obvious take, but uh, it is a kind of sign something's kind of wrong here. But yeah, it's not societally, ideal. Societally, but yeah. I'm still hey. recovering from my Oscars. I went all in on Tom. I thought he was really going to bring it and it just, my guy let me down. Get a special surprise for you guys today. Uh, before we get to that special surprise, we're going to talk about the following on today's pod. First, is it a good idea to prosecute a president? We'll find out. Uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping is in Moscow. Why did he go there? What did they talk about? And we'll talk about the latest on the war in Ukraine. Uh, French President Emmanuel Macron has an intense passion to raise the retirement age. We'll try to understand why and how he's doing it. Uh, a judicial coup in Israel. U.S. bank contagion spreads abroad. Ron DeSantis and Gitmo in some quicker updates. Uh, and then you are going to hear my interview with uh, an Ethiopian independent journalist named Miaza Mohammed. Uh, she was in L.A. last week. She won a big award from the State Department, was introduced at the White House. We talked about uh, Ethiopia's civil war and press freedom under Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Uh, you guys will be surprised to learn it's not great. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't start my, you know, independent blog uh, there without, you know, a lot of security concerns. Uh, yeah, she's arrested like three times in the last yeah. year. Yeah, what a turn that country has had. I mean, it seemed like such an optimistic case not that long ago. Yes, and I asked her about that. Uh, so the voice you're hearing is our friend, our new colleague, Max Fisher. Hey, guys. Excited to welcome him to the pod uh, for the first time, but not the last time for this this topic we're going to lead with. Uh, Max comes to Crooked Media from the New York Times. He's been a columnist. He's been an international reporter. We are thrilled to have him as part of the Crooked Media team. You're going to hear him on a lots of shows, but we are particularly excited uh, to have another foreign policy geek in this building. This is big for Ben and I. I don't don't sell the people out there short. They're they're more foreign policy geeks. There's geeks everywhere. You're right. You're <laughs> right. Dozens you're right. of us. You're right. Yeah, There's <laughs> quite about it. You yeah. Know. But Max, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm so happy to be here, guys. I've been listening for years, as you know. I just there's a, a lot of reasons that we will talk about that I feel like this is the place to be for kind of where our country is and where people are in their media habits. Um, really excited to be on Pod Save the World now, hopefully more in the future. I'm going to be on Offline with John Favreau, and we are cooking up some other really cool stuff that we are very excited to unveil for everyone really soon, I think. Absolutely. And uh, you guys probably noticed we're trying to do more episodes than just one per week of Pod Save the World and are excited to work with Max on that. So, okay, first topic, the reason we wanted you here is Trump, everyone might have noticed, has said he's about to be indicted for paying a $130,000 hush payment uh, to an adult film star named Stormy Daniels in exchange for her silence during the 2016 campaign. The press corps, the cops in New York are on the edge of their seats trying to find out. This would be the first such indictment in American history. Max, you have dug into this issue in the past and reported on it. What have other countries done and, and how do you think it's worked out for them? Well, so just to like give away the answer a little bit, the lessons that we can learn from other countries that have prosecuted presidents, which is actually America is really unusual in that it hasn't prosecuted past leaders. This is something that other countries do pretty routinely. But the lesson is that it is good to prosecute Trump. Hmm. This is the right thing to do. But it tells us a lot about what we can expect, what the kind of risks are, what the things are to look out for. And generally, when you talk to people who study this and look at the record, they will say there are kind of like two categories of countries that prosecute presidents, that it works very differently in those two. There are the like healthy, consolidated democracies, like <clears throat> France and South Korea mm -hmm. love to throw their former leaders in jail for corruption. They just, they do a ton of it. France South Korea, two of the last three former presidents? And it was almost three of the last four, but one of them died while he was right. in the yeah, trial. Right. So it's just like the overwhelming, and these are legit cases to be clear. Mm -hmm. These are like, they really did the crimes and they were facing what looked like fair punishments for it. But in countries where this happens, it is seen as a kind of like way to uphold the rule of law. You're mm -hmm. sending a message to future leaders. And it generally like, works out fine. And it's not that people don't try. Like Sarkozy, who's the French president who faced some corruption charges, 
uh, and I think was convicted on them, he really tried to like pull a Trump and to like get people mad and say like, oh, the courts are coming after us and this is the deep state. And people just didn't really buy it because they generally trust the justice system there. And then the other big category are the like weaker or younger democracies where it's really important to do this because you're trying to like establish rule of law and mm -hmm. establish norms and try to like stamp corruption out of the system. But it can also be really risky. And there are like a few different things that can happen, which are going to sound familiar to anyone following the news here in America. Um, it can be perceived rightly or wrongly as politicized in a way that can undermine trust in the justice system. And that can lead to rejection of the results. It can lead to unrest, protests. Um, sometimes leaders will get overzealous in pressing cases mm -hmm. against their former rivals who are out of power, which is not a good habit to get into for lots of reasons. And one is that something you see in countries like Peru or Bolivia and a lot of South America is that leads to this like really destructive tit for tat cycle where like mm -hmm. a new president comes in and the first thing they do is open cases against their predecessors. Might be happening in Pakistan right now where Imran Khan, former prime minister of Pakistan is facing charges that range from terrorism to corruption. He had to appear in court last week and is right. doing a, a he's taking a Trump like approach to right. rallying these people. Right. And it's one of these things where if, if the charges are somewhat politicized, then like any reaction is politicized and you just see these like really vicious cycles like in Pakistan of more and more distrust, more and more institutional breakdown. And it's actually a reason I was really surprised by this stat that 77% of new democracies that came out of a dictatorship never even try to prosecute the leaders of the former authoritarian system, like in Mexico, for example, because it's just seen that like the risks of that are a little bit too high. Hmm. So Ben, Nixon, pardoned by Gerald Ford for his role in Watergate, George H.W. Bush, pardoned uh, his Secretary of Defense and six others for the Iran-Contra affair. We just read a report over the weekend about uh, Reagan's staff cutting maybe a secret deal with the Iranians to yeah, keep the Iranian yeah. hostages in prison longer. He basically, the, the message was sent by uh, 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 you know, John Connolly, who is a Reagan supporter to other leaders in the Middle East, to tell Iran, don't release the hostages. Uh, before the election, don't help Carter, Reagan will cut you a better deal. Do you think people getting away with crimes. cases like this, <laughs> crimes like this, yeah. has sort of gotten us to this moment? I mean, I, I think the thing that Americans don't fully, we make a lot of fun of the British on this uh, podcast about the, the, the monarchy at times. Um, not the British generally, we like the British. Um, but we have a kind of a quasi-monarchical system. I mean, we kind of elect a monarch for four or eight years. Mm -hmm. and, and so we don't, we treat our presidents, you know, they're, they're literally faces carved on mountains. And we treat our presidents a little differently than France or South Korea, uh, and certainly than a prime ministerial system. Um, but I think it's worth kind of stepping back and asking, like, has that worked out too well? Because if you look at Nixon, and Ray, Nixon clearly committed crimes. No um, Iran-Contra, clearly there were a lot of crimes there, and Reagan and Bush both had their hands on some of those crimes. George H.W. Bush um, uh, said he didn't know anything about it, pardoned all these individuals who uh, committed the wrongdoing, but I think in his diaries said that he was fully briefed up on everything. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the point being is like, would our democracy be healthier if we had held some of those presidents accountable for their crimes? I mean, maybe the way we got to where we are today is in part having a system in which there, there was this kind of, you know, presumption that a president can do whatever he wants. As we even saw with uh, when you and I were in government and we were being warned against all these norms and, you know, like, for instance, don't nothing political on your computer. Mm -hmm. And then Trump has the RNC at on the South Lawn. And apparently that's fine. The you know? National like, Convention yeah, yeah, speech, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Point being is that I, I, I think the reason that we have not done it is less because we've had pristine presidents and more because we had this kind of quasi monarchical system. And I don't think that's worked out. Uh, Max is the counterpoint. Uh, Brazil, where former president, now current president, Lula da Silva was sentenced to 12 years in jail. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to wait and see if Lula prosecutes Jair Bolsonaro, yeah. who was the previous president. Right, right. Well, this, I mean, Brazil kind of shows the other side of this, that what if you defer more to prosecuting because it, it does have risks. And there is like still a really widespread perception in Brazil, which is not groundless. There's something to this, that the left-wing former presidents, Lula and Joma, were the, the, the charges are probably legitimate, but that the extent of the prosecution was probably political. And there's just like, there's almost not a way to do this, especially for the first time, that's going to be clean. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think, Ben, you're right that the kind of 
allowing the precedent to be set that like presidents and former presidents are not to be touched is partly why we're at this point of like, well, now it's too late. And now we really yeah. do have to test and we really do have to like try to prosecute a president. But there was also like a sense at the time, maybe not correct, but at least, you know, we know where he was coming from that Ford was thinking that like the risks of prosecuting it were going to be high. And he did try to like state a little bit of a middle ground where he endorsed the charges and basically said like he is guilty yeah. implicitly, but we're just not going to go through with it because we think the costs of it are going to be too high. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny, though. The Ford pardon is one of those things that if you like come into Washington, it's like treated as this like act of massive courage by mm -hmm. Ford. And yeah, it kind of wins the Red Hen Civility Award oh, yeah. for all right. time, you know. Right. And and nobody ever kind of tests that assumption. C Congressional you know? Civility uh, Medal yeah, of Honor. Yeah. Yeah. And there's probably something to that, right? You've just been through a very divisive period, not just like Watergate, but Vietnam and assassinations and all the rest of it. And for, you know, the statesman argument is he was putting that behind us. And but I mean, at the same time, like what what message was sent, what you know, and it, it is notable. And obviously, the, it's hard to ignore the partisan piece of this. But I'm sure that there's some Republicans that would have some things to say about Clinton's on this, uh, mm -hmm. this issue. Although that was a little different. <laughs> the, the behavior in question was less criminal and more about appropriateness. But the, at the same time, it, it, look at the Republican presence since since Nixon was pardoned, there's been kind of a sense of impunity, you know, around mm. certain kinds of things, you know, um, and uh, and why wouldn't there be uh, given the track record? You know? So I called up a guy at the University of Washington named James Long, who's a political scientist who has studied cases abroad of former leaders being prosecuted to ask like, what is what makes the difference between a case where it's like a France or a South Korea where it basically goes fine and it, you don't leave, you don't see the kind of like backlash you don't see like what we're seeing now in Israel with like Benjamin Netanyahu trying to like take power in a coup to mm -hmm. avoid charges or the cases that work out really poorly like the Israels like arguably what's happening in Brazil like Pakistan and I expected him to say that it was going to be about the perceived independence of the justice system, or it would be about levels of polarization, or it would be about how popular is the president or former leaders being prosecuted. But he actually said that those aren't the biggest factors. The biggest one that he had found was actually the number of charges that were brought and the severity of the charges. And he said, if that number is really low- So not like you, a hush money payment to a porn star? Right. You know, as, as your well, first that, that was what I said. Right. I was yeah, like, yeah. does that mean that this is like bad? And he said, no, because everybody knows that this is one of many things and everybody knows that this is- And it, So the example that he cited, which I thought was really instructive with Jacob Zuma, who is of course yeah. the president yeah. of South Africa from 2009 to 2018, super influential, super powerful within his party, within his base. Super and corrupt. <laughs> incredibly yeah. corrupt, yeah. And when he was first charged, like really tried to do like a full Trump and was like, the deep state is coming after us and the courts are corrupt and take to the streets and like seize our government. And there was this fear because there were these riots that killed like 300 people that this might like actually kind of be it for South African democracy. And the, um, James Long, the guy I was talking to, said that what he saw was that that quieted down because the justice system in South Africa started piling on more and more charges. And they got up to like 15 charges over 800 different instances of corruption. And when that happened, everything just kind of fizzled out because people were kind of like, well, even if this is our guy and we like him and we don't trust the state, there's a lot here. And now that case is just kind of like plodding along. So I thought that was a like a, a good sign of optimism that because we have so many charges against Trump mm -hmm. that, and you see it now, like you see people are just like not mobilizing for him. It's funny when uh, politicians get charged you, or even go to jail and kind of use it sort of jujitsu politically, like Silvio Berlusconi, the former prime minister of Italy. I think he went to jail for a little while and is now back and sort of you know yeah. a player in Italian politics. Chavez. The, yeah, another one that's silver lining for Bibi Netanyahu, who is facing multiple uh, charges in Israel. Former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Ormert served 16 months in jail for corruption, and he wrote a book while he was there. So, you know, you can use your time well. <laughs> It take up water. I don't think Trump's yeah. going to write a book. Yeah, do a Bush. <laughs> a lot of people will uh, consider Bush a war criminal, and he's taken a painting already, yeah. so he's out of the game. Uh, Max, Thriving. thank you very much. You brought great perspective and real reporting to this. Man, he's calling up he's political scientists. We got to get on our game. Phone calls. <laughs> That's the move. That's the move. All right. Well, the, the first of many, and we were talking about branding this. Uh, we had Max Faxer taking it to the max, uh, maximized minute. I don't know. We'll we'll work on some the branding. max moment. Max moment. your moment of max, max factor mentality. <laughs> okay.
<laughs> Thanks, man. All right, Ben, let's turn to Ukraine because there have been some big updates. Uh, the first is that Chinese President Xi Jinping traveled to Moscow to visit uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin. God knows what those... It's like a multi-day visit, right? Three days. Three days. What do you think they talk about? That's got to be a brutal, brutal conversation. Well, we'll, we'll get to it. Um, who knows what there was discussed. The, the optics of two dictators for life sitting together in the same room uh, where Reagan and Gorbachev met in the 1980s and declared an end to the Cold War says a lot. Uh, you better believe Putin's going to maximize the propaganda value in all of this, both home at home and abroad. So Putin also wrote an article for Chinese state media. He criticized the U.S. for trying to deter Russia and China and said that NATO is, quote, seeking to penetrate the Asia Pacific. Uh, Xi's visit comes right after the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Putin for war crimes. Uh, I kind of, Ben, stepping back, I think I suspect the two leaders have slightly different goals from this visit. I think both want to show up the United States and the West and make clear that the United States can't push them around. I think the Russians want to look less isolated uh, by the war in Ukraine. I'm sure they want economic and military support, including weapons. The White House seems to believe or believes that China still hasn't decided whether or not to provide Russia with arms. So that's a good thing. Um, President Xi is pushing this 12-point peace plan Point one says each country should respect the other's territorial integrity. That would be great if it happened before the war. But, you know, sort of taken in totality, this plan seems to be more like an attempt to freeze the conflict in a way that would help Russia and shut down Western sanctions. Um, she didn't discuss the plan with the Ukrainians before he released it. Uh, but either way, he seems to want to be a peacemaker. And this comes on the heels of, of China brokering the truce between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Ben, uh, what did you make of, of this summit and the kind of you know, on edge feeling in Washington about it happening. I mean, I thought this was a huge deal, actually. I mean, first of all, they they dialed the the pomp and circumstance up. You know, three days. Uh, I think there are a hundred Chinese officials. That yeah, are you were saying before, this is the Cadillac plan. Yeah, this is the Cadillac plan. I mean, that like <laughs> what did Obama get? It, we did not get this. We did not have uh, like dinner in Ivan the Terrible's chambers at <laughs> the Kremlin. We did not bring a hundred people over with us. Um, and and so I I just. This is coming at, at it could not be at a more critical time for Putin, right? Mm-hmm. Like he, he is entering into the second year of this war. We've talked about how consequential the spring offensives are going to be. Mm-hmm. And he wants to show that he's not isolated. And what more could show that than the president of the biggest country in the world, and the second largest economy, yeah. decamping there for three days? And and I actually think, you know, I see some people say, well, you know, she failed to echo his support for the war. He doesn't need to. Like by being there... Yeah, the image kind of says the image all. says everything. It's not like you know Xi has to go defend Putin's view of Ukraine. Just being there is a massive endorsement of Putin. I also think like the peace plan coming at the same time. Putin's plan is look, and we're going to get into this, but he's got a lot more land than he did a year ago. I mean, this is something we don't talk about because you know the, the, he didn't take Kiev, but he has his land bridge in southern Ukraine that connects Crimea to eastern Ukraine. Mm-hmm. He is going to want to be trying to freeze this conflict this year. Like yeah. that's his plan. And so if if she is framing a, I have this diplomacy and it's a peace plan and let's just stop it, a ceasefire, like that is is also, you know, to, to Putin's interest. So to me, this is the Chinese, you know, clearly taking a side. And look, I think we have to, you know, what's in it for them? I mean, look what's happening in this country now. And I'm not saying there aren't reasons for it to be happening, but like We've got a, a special committee devoted to the destruction of the Chinese Communist Party. Oh, you're talking about the U.S. Yeah, in the yeah, U.S., right. right? We're we're shooting down balloons, like, right. it, it, like why? Of course, they're getting closer. I mean, right. this Blocking is kind of tech where, exports. yeah, this is where the world is headed. This decoupling, um, and and China is shown time and again that faced with the choice between kind of bending to U.S. pressure on something, or kind of taking a harder line, doing things we don't like, getting close to the Iranians, getting close to the Russians. <clears throat> Sorry, getting close to the Iranians, getting close to the Russians. They're going to do that, right? And so to me, it, this is a, a sign of kind of where the the geopolitical you know plates are underneath the surface of, of the earth and where they're going to be for a while. And uh, we shouldn't be sanguine about that. And it reminds us that that this is not the whole world supporting Ukraine. This is the West supporting Ukraine. And and the Chinese and Russians and their their 
group supporting the Russians. Yeah, the, the Economist had a really interesting analysis of the visit. They pointed out that she and Putin have met 39 times over their duration of their career. So this is not a new relationship. They know what they're getting from the other. They also got into the interesting history about you know, uh, back in the 50s, there was a split between Chairman Mao and Russia under Khrushchev that kind of opened the door a crack for Nixon and his rapprochement with the Chinese. And then Russia and China got closer again after the West put in place an arms embargo after Tiananmen Square in 1989. And it sort of feels like this is a continuation of that trajectory. And they also got into the fact that, uh, you know, in 2022, Russian exports of crude oil and gas to China rose in dollar terms by 44% and 100% uh, respectively. So the, China's already been a huge lifeline for the Russians, whether or not they ultimately sell them these advanced drones. Yeah, I think we're, we're like really focused on these drones, but they, between the purchases of energy, but also they're, they're, they're making whole the Russian you know, demand for chips and for parts and all the things that we're trying to restrict from getting in, they're backfilling some of that. They can't backfill all of it. Um, and, and so they're already providing pretty enormous support. And I think it's a we should check our, you know, there's some commentary in the US like the Chinese are going to hate this invasion. You know, Xi must be regretting saying that he was best friends with Putin. I don't see any evidence that that's the yeah, case. I like, like I sometimes we project onto China, they're going to be embarrassed if Russia does war crimes like what well, they don't seem to be that concerned about that and and you know that that speaks to how big this challenge is yeah uh, a quick aside just before we get to the sort of broader ukraine reality u.s news reported that back in 2021 you remember 2021 when the indian and chinese militaries were fighting yeah. this like high altitude yeah. battle in like the hand -hand Himalayas, combat literally yeah, like yeah. hitting each other with like bats with nails in yeah. them and shit uh, U.S. News reported that the U.S. provided India with intelligence about the Chinese military's troop movements in the in the area that helped India win some of those battles, but infuriated the Chinese. I had not heard that before. Yeah, the, like the, again, I, I don't. Um, it may be inevitable, um, but you know we are taking a very confrontational stance to China, mm -hmm. and we can't then be surprised when the Chinese do things we really don't like, yep. you know, Not and it started under yet. Trump, but it's continued, it's kind of bipartisan. Um, and look, there's good reasons to have serious issues with the Chinese Communist Party. I do worry about the need. I'd rather be talking to the Chinese. And right now it just feels like we, we have very little diplomacy with them. Um, because they're they're not going anywhere. <laughs> There's nope. over a billion people. Yeah. Uh, so I, I I do think that that we should be looking to try to see if turning down the 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 dial might help our objectives in places like Ukraine a little for bit sure. more, you know? So we should talk about the reality of the war for a minute uh, on the Ukrainian side, because at the end of last year in particular, Ukraine was on a roll. There was this surprise offensive. They took a huge amount of territory and you saw a lot of commentators uh, talking like the war was over or yeah. Laura's about to be over. And I think things look very different today. Some of the facts on the ground. So uh, Ukraine has reportedly taken 100,000 casualties. Uh, the Ukrainian side denies that number, but clearly the fighting has been unbelievably brutal. And in war, some of the first to die are your best trained, most experienced men who, like any military commander will tell you, is your most valuable resource. You know, And, and Ukraine just does not have as many bodies to throw at the fight as Russia does. Um, there has been this battle for months in Bakhmut. Initially, it was seen as advantageous for Ukraine because the Russians were taking more casualties. But again, those were Wagner Group members. They were a mercenary group that wasn't trained. And my understanding is now that the ratio of Ukrainian to Russian dead has gotten far better for the Russian side, but Ukraine has not abandoned that fight. Uh, for months, you've been hearing Western countries sound the alarm about Ukraine's dwindling ammo supplies in NATO and the US's inability to manufacture enough or even find enough in current stock piles yeah. to fill the gap. Um, Zelensky and the United States and other Western leaders have failed to convince countries in the global south, in particular in, in Africa, to get on board with sanctions uh, or support for Ukraine. They have reservations uh, about, I don't know, a lot of countries in Africa have reservations about sort of being seen as shoulder to shoulder with the US, UK, the French, you know, a lot yeah. of like colonial um, reasons there. Uh, Russia sells a lot of arms and puts uh, Wagner forces in a lot of Russian countries. So the, the kind of list could go on and on, Ben, but I think the basic point is um, things are 
getting worse for the Ukrainian side. And we keep hearing about this planned spring offensive that Ukraine will launch. Uh, and it gets more challenging by the day because they're losing good troops. And the stakes seem to be ratcheting up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. everyone's like, well, if they don't win this, it's time to cut a deal. Yeah. That's exactly the point. You know, everything has been channeling into this, you know, spring offensive that we feel like we've been talking about for a long time now. Because in part, um, if Ukraine can't show like a lot of momentum in that, um, they're in a position where it's not clear that they can continue to mount offensives. Um, put aside the F-16 type question, just like this, the ammo question, like the can they replenish their stockpiles mm -hmm. that they've been burning down in places like Bakhmut that, that, you know, because the West didn't foresee the need to fight a major artillery war, it's not like we're flush with ammo here, you know, um, and it takes time to ramp up the industrial production of, of that kind of ammunition. So they, they, they might literally not be able to mount an offensive after this spring one for a while until they can kind of replenish stuff. At the same time, by the way, the same thing applies to the Russians. <laughs> They're low on ammo sure. too, but they can hold this land and they have more- Bigger people. military they, industrial they have, complex Yeah, too, more I human mean. beings and, and they can turn that ent entire military industrial complex into this task. So you're, the, the situation that I think is, is probably concerning the Ukrainians is if you get into the summer and, you know, you still have Russia occupying huge swaths of, of eastern and southern Ukraine, and the momentum in the international community is like, yeah, let's, you know, the Chinese have a peace plan and Putin says he wants a ceasefire and a couple of European governments are starting to say like, wait a second, like yeah. I, we need to stop and take a pause here. I think what you'll see there is also a, a test for the Western, you know, alliance insofar as it's held together. Do you start to see fractures? You know, the, the moment that Putin wanted to come earlier in the war does feel like it might be approaching. Now, the alternative is that the Ukrainians have a lot of battlefield success and they take a bunch of territory and it's like, let's just keep up the momentum and keep this going. But it does make it feel like a lot is riding on this offensive, probably more than anybody's comfortable with because the structural dynamics of the war right now kind of play into Putin's, let's just wait these people out, grind Long it out, game. hold on to our territory. You could look at it from this perspective. Ukraine has already won the sense that it's a viable country. They they kept their government. They kept Kyiv. They're, they're drawn closer to Europe. Um, what might they ask for in those negotiations to, you know, NATO membership, et cetera. Um, but we shouldn't ignore the fact that that Russia has made these territorial gains and and they too might be very happy with a ceasefire this summer, you know? Yeah. If there was a ceasefire this summer, it, it seems like Russia would have picked up a lot of territory yeah. and they're probably happy with that. And it would be, you know, maybe phase one of a multi-phase war to take the rest. Yeah. Um, and that's Putin's long game. Um, okay. Well, we're obviously uh, watching this one closely, but let's turn to France uh, where, Ben, the most controversial topic in the country is the number 49.3. Seems exciting, right? So that is the article of the French Constitution that lets the government push a bill through the National Assembly, uh, the lower house of the French Parliament, without a vote, which is very weird that you could even do that. But here's the rub in this sort of high stakes game of, of French political poker. If you use Article 49.3, the opposition party then has 24 hours to respond to its use with a no confidence vote. And if that no confidence vote passes through the parliament, if you get an absolute majority of members to vote for it, then the government's proposed bill gets tossed out, as does the prime minister and the cabinet. Uh, so the whole government gets tossed out except for the president. So high stakes stuff. So why the hell are we talking about this, you ask? Because French President Emmanuel Macron has wanted to raise the retirement age in France since he first got elected in 2017. That plan sort of went on pause during the pandemic and everything else. Uh, and before his re-election. And before his re-election, yeah. yeah. A little more cynical. Uh, but he spent the last couple of months fighting to try to get parliament to pass this bill failed to garner enough political support. So last week he used Article 49.3 to jam it through. Opposition parties called a no confidence vote, which he uh, narrowly survived on Monday. The no confidence vote got 278 votes, nine short of what was needed. There have been months and months of protests and periodic strikes against Macron's uh, retirement increase plan. Uh, those continued after the failed no confidence vote. Opponents are now preparing legal cha challenges. So... 
like again, Ben. French really <laughs> like their retirement. I, I get it. Yeah, it's wild. <laughs> like I get the sort of actuarial argument yeah. for raising the retirement age, right? There's used to be, I think, four to one sort of workers to retirees. Now it's like two and a half to one. People are living longer. Eventually a state backed pension system won't be able to care for everyone. Yeah. But I don't get the urgency or the obvious passion for making <laughs> people work longer. And now there's this added like rub of his opponents fairly fairly, I think, arguing that he used this completely anti-democratic means to ram it through. Like, what am I missing here politically? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, there's like a profound neoliberal heart beating inside of Emmanuel <laughs> Macron, right? Like, like, like and, and, you know, to be fair, like he's not the only person who's looked at France's books and thought, yeah. hey, we can't maintain this generous welfare Definitely. state if we don't um, raise retirement age. But but uh, to me, what what is it? The real takeaway is like Macron came in and he probably had a bunch of ref- – he wanted to be a, a historic French president. He, he seems like he's constantly thinking about his place in history. Oh, for sure. And so this is probably on his list of things that he wanted to get done to, to, to position himself as this historic French president, to be able to say, you know, I was this transformative transitional president for a decade. He's term limited out. I think what, what it says to me, though, is when he came in, he built this new political party on Marsh, and he kind of broke the left and the right. They didn't really kind of ha- know how to deal with this large centrist party that occupied all this real estate. And part of what's happened is that party has proven to be a useful vehicle to Macron, but it, it's basically fallen apart. It's, it's just him now. And, but the other parties are broken, too. And so what he's kind of doing is he's like just a bull in the china shop of French politics. Like, and, and meanwhile, he's getting his shit done, right? Yeah. And this thing may get done. What I worry about, Tommy, is it's ginning up all this resentment and populism on the left and the right. And so you start to worry, even though we've got a few more years of Macron, like, you know, number one, like, what's next? You know, is he radicalizing? You've got a far right that wants to come right. in for sure. And is he making that more likely by what he's doing, you know, by pissing everybody off and, and, and alienating younger voters and things like that. Um, that's concern one. And two, is he like, you know, he is governing in pretty undemocratic ways. And just because he seems like a non-autocrat, you know, <laughs> he seems like, you know, the he, uh, doesn't mean that, you know, he's not testing some norms that if Marine Le Pen came comes in oh, we'd all be screaming, and yeah. starts using the same tactics to ram through bills, you know, that deal with identity and immigration, we'll, we'd all be freaking out about this in, in the rest of the uh, democratic world. So, so yeah, I think that whatever you think about his, the the mechanics of his retirement proposal, doing it like this is carries huge risks for France. I think Article forty nine point three has been used a hundred times since nineteen fifty eight. So it happens, but not that often. Uh, Macron reportedly threatened to dissolve the parliament entirely if the no confidence vote went through. So we would have forced all these kind of members who have been dealing with protests and everything else to face elections. So that probably helped them survive. There are actually two no confidence vote efforts: one from the far right, which like nobody wanted to touch, yeah. and then one from the sort of you know like never Trump Republican yeah, type yeah, party. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but again, you know the, the retirement age in Germany is sixty five and seven months and. Italy at 67. EU is mostly 65. So, you know, Macron is kicking this beehive of this sort of like deeply held cultural feeling in France that you get to retirement. That's like the golden age of life. The average French person spends 25% of life in retirement. Macron's only 45. So yeah. he's going to have a long retirement. Yeah, I'm just yeah, surprised yeah, yeah, he's trying yeah. to screw it up for everybody. Well, and they, they've always had shorter work weeks there. I mean, Sounds you great. know, it, it is, you know, I mean, it, it, it's a choice, right? I mean, if you if you would rather, you know, uh, organize society that way, I, I think the challenge is like, can you pay all your benefits? Yeah. I think what the left would say is that they could tax rich people more. Right. They already tax them a hell of a lot more than here. Um, but again, like even if you think there's some common sense behind what Macron's doing, eh, like there's some political risk to the way he's doing it. Not for him. Like he'll be fine. Like he's going to be president for three more years. Yeah. Um, the risk is for what where France is going. So speaking of that risk, uh, the last financial crisis certainly helped the far right movements across yeah. the, the globe. Currently, you know, we're dealing with all this turmoil in the U.S. banking system and it's starting to be felt abroad. This mess started with the failure of Silicon Valley Bank or SVB on March 10th. Uh, the gist of what happened was in 2021, they were fat and happy. They got a ton of new customer deposits. Everything was great. They made all these bad investment decisions where they tied up big chunks of money in long-term bonds right as depositors were trying to get their money back, had to sell at a loss. That led a bunch of tech investor types to freak out 
tell everyone to pull their money out of SVB, which started a bank run, and now the bank is no more. So since then, Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, they've, they've taken a number of steps to help ensure that other small banks in the U.S. stay solvent. But in the meantime, Ben, the contagion is spread overseas to Switzerland, where the Swiss government had to broker a deal for UBS to purchase its rival uh, Credit Suisse for about $3 billion. The government backstopped that deal. Uh, last week, Credit Suisse customers were withdrawing up to $10 billion per day. So this SVB collapse in the U.S. led everybody to sort of like scrub balance sheets for weaknesses. Uh, Credit Suisse had many because of scandals and screw ups and losses over the years. Uh, in December of 2022, they raised, Credit Suisse did, $4 billion from investors. When that was all said and done, the Saudi National Bank had a 9.9% ownership stake. In the midst of this sort of like tumult, uh, the chairman of the Saudi bank was asked if they were planning to buy more shares in Credit Suisse. He said, absolutely not, which he had said before, but that triggered a panic. Shares went into a tailspin. Uh, and when the thing, when Credit Suisse was no more, the Saudi National Bank lost a billion dollars on the deal, according to CNBC. So, ouch. Yeah, maybe not, a, not a lot of money to the Saudis. Don't do that interview. Uh, so, like, listeners might be saying, like, okay, who cares, right? In, in the near term, Thousands of jobs will be lost in Switzerland. You know, that could have an impact there. But I do worry about, you know, this. What will the reaction be if we, through our mismanagement of banks in the US, precipitate another global financial crisis? You talk about lack of, you know, loss of standing in the world. Yeah. Well, especially like, I mean, you know, you, you, we, you guys have talked about SVB. Uh, the only thing I'll add to it is it'd be kind of insane if. It started with like some medium-sized bank, you know. <laughs> like it's one thing when it's like Lehman Brothers, and right. it's it's how all of Wall Street was operating. That was the financial crisis. This is basically like a bunch of these fucking small, medium-sized banks got out from under their regulatory uh, imperatives uh, because of some Trump legislation. In part, I know that's not the whole story, but if that's like part of what knocks over the first domino in a banking crisis, I think that what this speaks to generally, though, that concerns me is that. We're looking at a lot of instability. Like we've talked a lot about the risk of instability in Iran, you know, in Ukraine, with the you know Taiwan is obviously the 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 biggest risk out there. But even in the way in which you know the U.S. and China are are competing now, like that that's going to be very disruptive to the global economy. Is that the the two of us kind of untangle from one another? Um, it just feels like if something comes along. And it introduces like another layer of risk to this because you could argue that this is tied to the geopolitical events because it's the cost of living and and you know the interest rate rises have contributed right to oh these, inflation for yeah. I mean the, the the right inflation was made worse by the cost of oil and gas going up which exactly was started by the war right so exactly all right? tied together so it does tie together and and so I just kind of worried that we're sometimes we I, I think we're acting like the economies are are healthier than they are and that that these external shocks are not going to stop because sometimes people are like, well, it was just a pandemic. Well, no, there's like wars happening now. And I, 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 I just feels a little tenuous. Out Look, there. I, I think the story of SBB is the, whoop, sorry, let's say this better. I think that like the big takeaway for me for SVB is you can't assume like we're fighting the last war and that we're going to see the problem coming. It's going to be something no one expected, which is a bank in Silicon Valley buying too many long-term bonds, treasury yeah. bonds yeah, and yeah. that like undoing the banking system for a couple of weeks. But yes, uh, worrisome. And I don't think the story is over. Um, speaking of kind of ongoing disasters, Ben, uh, on Sunday, President Biden called Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu about his plan to rip away power from the uh, Israeli judiciary. Uh, I love that uh, Haaretz ha calls it a judicial coup in just their straight news copy. Yeah. Just a fantastic editorial decision. So Biden's call came after Netanyahu rejected a compromise proposal from the Israeli president. Um, the New York Times, by the way, reported on how the architects of this judicial coup plan are two American guys from Queens who started a think tank <laughs> in the U.S. And it's partly funded by a right wing American billionaire. So, again, it's good to know we're exporting our, yeah. our bullshit abroad. Yeah. Um, there was some good news out of Israel, Ben, which was that senior officials from uh, the Israeli and Palestinian Authority side met in Egypt to discuss ways to de-escalate tensions. That was the, there were two sets of meetings, I believe, which were the highest level discussions between the two sides in 10 years. That fact alone kind of like jumped out at me that these guys just not really yeah, been since talking. Yeah, the John Kerry process, yeah. So um, the other thing that I noticed is 
views of the conflict have shifted dramatically among members of the Democratic Party in the U.S. In 2016, 53% of Democrats said they sympathized more with the Israelis, uh, 23% with the Palestinians. When Gallup asked the question again this February, 38% of Democrats said they sympathized most with the Israelis, uh, while 49% said they sympathized most with the Palestinians, so like completely flipped. Um, I guess just stepping back, like I wonder how much of this is facts on the ground and reporting and wars in Gaza and like, you know, images out of Sheikh Jarrah versus Netanyahu's decision to fully embrace Trump. I mean, yeah. a majority of Democrats continue to view Israel favorably, but that too is down. I think it's I think it's more the latter. You know, I mean, you and I are most concerned with the direction Netanyahu has been going mm -hmm. and the treatment of Palestinians and in, in, in places like Gaza and Sheikh Jarrah. Um, and that's clearly impacting, I think, people who follow this issue closely, including people in the American Jewish community who, you know, particularly when you look at the judicial coup, um, you know, are, 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 are in almost an existential crisis about how to think about um, support for Israel with a government that is this extreme. But I also think, you know, we talked about that a lot. I, I, the other piece here, though, is that the decision by Netanyahu uh, and by the way, by like APAC in this country mm -hmm. to just completely embrace the Trumpian support for 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 right wing Israeli politics, but not just Trump, like Pompeo, the kind of evangelical yeah, the right wing Christian, you know, the, the kind of right wing evangelical obsession with support for Israel, which, as we've talked about, is tied in part to the the idea that the rapture is going to come. Right. But that, that there's a cost to that. And the, I think that. APAC and others in this country have thought they could just bank all this Republican support and then primary Democrats, you know, mm -hmm. but the, everybody can see that happening. And, you know, we remember the Republican National Convention, Mike Pompeo appearing in a political speech and he was in the Holy City. Is he from on the U.S. He was in Embassy Jerusalem. He was in Jerusalem. Yeah, it's yeah. very weird. And it was just like that kind of stuff adds up. And look, at a certain point, like in in solidifying this kind of hard right evangelical support, you, you may lose like the preponderance of the Democratic Party. And just because you can win a congressional primary in Michigan, which APAC and others got involved in, you know, to support one candidate over the other, that that doesn't mean that in the long run <laughs> this is a losing strategy um, for for the Demo for for maintaining Democratic support for Israel. Yeah, I forgot about that. Pompeo delivered his RNC speech while on a taxpayer funded trip. To Israel. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, that's pretty that is, crazy, you know? That is out there. That is out there. Uh, but we are not just talking about Trump today. Uh, we got to talk about Ron DeSantis because a former detainee at Guantanamo Bay Prison claimed that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis watched him being tortured while DeSantis was stationed at the prison uh, and this individual was being held. So DeSantis was a Navy JAG officer. He was stationed at Guantanamo Bay from March 2006 through 2007. This account is from a report in The Independent. So this detainee's name uh, is Mansour Adafi. He's a Yemeni citizen who was held at Gitmo for 14 years. Adafi went on a hunger strike in 2006 to protest the conditions at Gitmo. This was very common at the time. Uh, and the U.S. response was often brutal. They would strap detainees to a chair, force a tube up their nose uh, and into their stomach so that you know, a nurse or someone could pour a protein drink directly into this individual's stomach. Uh, the U.N. Commission on Human Rights and the International Committee of the Red Cross both said force feeding was torture. DeSantis refused to comment for this story, but here's a clip about of him talking about his time at Gitmo from the campaign trail back in 2018. So were you interviewing terrorists? Were you were you were you a legal advisor? I was a legal advisor for those um, that were doing the things that would happen. Is the thing you notice the day you get down there is for these detainees, the jihad was still ongoing, right. and they would wage jihad any way they can. Now they're in a facility, so it's limited. But some of the things they would do, they would do hunger strikes, and you actually had three detainees that committed suicide with hunger strikes. So everything at that time was legal in nature, one way or another. So the commander wants to know, well, how do I combat this? So one of the jobs of the legal advisor would be like, hey, you actually can force feed. Here's what you can do. Here's kind of the rules of that. You also had a lot of detainees claiming abuse because this was in 
in the wake of Abu Ghraib, and that was used offensively against our guards. So our guards would have feces thrown at them, all this other stuff, and yet they would be charged with detainee abuse, so we had to evaluate all that. So what I learned from that and I took to Iraq when I was working with SEAL Team 1 is they are using things like detainee abuse offensively against us. It was a tactic, technique, and procedure. So obviously you can tell by that, you know, DeSantis is not denying this. Uh, Adafi said of DeSantis, he was watching and I was really screaming, crying. I was bleeding and throwing up. We were in the block yard, so they were close to the fence and groups would watch this happen. He also said that DeSantis had told him previously that he was there to make sure detainees were treated uh, humanely. I think the, the bigger picture point here, Ben, is <laughs> DeSantis emerged from his time at Gitmo as like an unrepentant champion of the place. You know, he thinks it's good. Um, and, you know, I should point out that our former boss, President Obama, tried to close Gitmo but couldn't because Congress blocked him. He ended up defending force feeding detainees because he said he didn't want them to die. But the whole thing is just a stain on our country's history. So I don't know, just like, I feel like just when we thought we were stepping back from the worst excesses of the war on terror, like 20 years after the war in Iraq, we're like back with Ron DeSantis defending force feeding of detainees in, in Gitmo. And just to be reminded that Gitmo is still open just because like Republicans didn't want Barack Obama to be able to close it, you know, yeah. um, and enough Democrats went along with that, by the way, uh, is insane because this is all the more reason uh, to, to, to have, have closed that prison. Yeah. Um, look, it doesn't surprise me about, you know, DeSantis has a bit of a, you know, sadist quality to him, you know. It does give you that impression uh, Yeah, sometimes. like I, I, and I'm not saying that lightly, that, you know, like it, there's something kind of chilling about the guy. Um, it doesn't surprise me that, that this kind of thing wouldn't necessarily affect him on a on a human level. Um, I do think that he he's coming across as like a particularly you know, he takes the worst of all aspects of Republican foreign policy <laughs> because you know we we talked about you know, like his you know de- declaration of support for Russia's view of the war in Ukraine mm-hmm. via Tucker Carlson. So he's not like your cookie cutter neocon who likes Gitmo and you know, also wants to support the Ukrainians. Like he's, he's, he's picking from the menu and he's like, I'm for the, the treatment at Gitmo. Uh, I'm, I'm for the like Tucker Carlson line on Russia. He, he's kind of a Frankenstein of the worst aspects of the Republican right. party's view of American national security and exceptionalism. You know? Yeah. So just, it's worth pointing out the U S government event ultimately said it wasn't clear if this det- detainee, uh, Adafi was a member of Al Qaeda but if he was, he was probably a low-level fighter. Uh, the Independent asked Adafi about DeSantis, and he said, quote, he's a bad person. You know, I like America, and such people, when they come to power, they create a lot of problems. I have no hate against him, but at the same time, as a lawyer, as someone who is a graduate of law and believes in the law, he should have known better. If you love your country, if you love your people, if you believe in American values, you should be the first one who called for the closure of Guantanamo. Well I said. I mean, he said it better than we could. Um, that's 100% true. That's 100% true. Uh, okay, a couple quicker things before we get to the interview. Uh, so, Ben, some some good news. Uh, an American aid worker abducted by militants in Niger more than six years ago was finally freed. Uh, Jeffrey Woodkey was captured in Niger in October of 2016. U.S. officials believed he was taken to Mali or Burkina Faso and held there. A French journalist who was taken hostage in 2021 was also released. I mean... Did this sounds like this happened when you were in the White House. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah, yeah. This, I, I mean, this is um, uh, this is a part of the world where you've had you know a lot of this over the years, uh, and, and where European governments you know uh, like had, had paid ransoms to. Yeah, it sounds um, like the French helped negotiate this. Yeah, so um, there's kind of these weird pipelines uh, to have dialogue and communication and. We were constantly trying to get the Europeans to not pay ransoms, but but there are kind of established channels for resolving this. What you don't want to see is obviously the incentivization of taking people like this, but it's just whenever you can get somebody out of this situation um, for, for the United States in particular because we don't pay ransoms, it's it's a huge uh, relief. Man, six years in yeah. captivity. I can't imagine. Unimaginable. Yeah. Uh, can you imagine those conditions too? I mean, it's, yeah. it's unthinkable. Horrific, yeah. horrific. Uh, turning to India. Thousands of police officers uh, in Punjab, India, have spent several days now conducting a statewide manhunt searching for a Sikh separatist leader named uh, Ampratal Singh. Authorities have even cut off internet access across the whole Punjab region and have detained hundreds of his supporters. 
the Indian government is worried about this guy basically calling for a separate estate for the Sikh uh, religious majority in Punjab. Uh, there was a battle with a separatist insurgency back in the 80s. Thousands of people died. Uh, Singh and his supporters recently stormed a police station to demand the release of some of his guys. Uh, but, you know, even as of this recording, Ben, the Indian authorities have not caught him despite seemingly having like cops, paramilitary forces, like everybody out on the street. I was trying to figure out kind of where Punjab is in, in the general uh, ranking in terms of population uh, compared to the U.S. And I figured a rough equivalent is the U.S. government shutting off communications in the state of Kentucky to yeah. do a manhunt. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about this is, yes, you've had these kinds of tensions flare up. Uh, but when you have a government that is moving in a very religious nationalist direction, right? a Hindu nationalist government under Narendra Modi, you're going to end up having more sectarian tension because, you know, if, whether it's a Muslim minority, a Sikh minority, uh, you know, others in India that don't feel a part of what Modi's doing. I'm not, you know, this may be more complicated. This guy will has, I'm sure, his own agendas. But I do think that it, one risk of taking a country in the direction that Modi has is that you're, you stir the pots of all these potential sectarian conflicts you yeah. know, that, that have been really violent at times uh, in South Asia. Certainly make it a hell of a lot easier for them to um, recruit people in, in yeah. good favor. Yeah. Uh, lastly, so a new analysis of genetic samples from China now appear to link the pandemic's origin to raccoon dogs. We're, of course, talking about COVID-19. Uh, the Atlantic reported, quote, it's some of the strongest support yet. Experts told me that the pandemic began when SARS-CoV-2 hopped from animals into humans rather than an accident among scientists experimenting with the virus, end quote. We may never know for sure, but uh, I saw a recent poll. There's a Quinnipiac poll that shows Americans believe the lab leak theory 64-22 over natural transmission. Now. Which is just a crazy stat. And again, I return to a point I've made, which is I, I, I don't understand why it's somehow like if your goal is to say that the Chinese government didn't handle this properly. Like why having an illegal wet market where this could happen is somehow... Fine, and and but if it's a lab leak, it's you yeah, know it just sounds it, it, it just sounds nefarious, more nefarious, you know, yeah. and it allows for a biological weapons conspiracy theory. It's just kind of strange to me how much investment there is in this lab leak theory among the 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 lab leak you know devotees here. You know, I know, and look, I, we will probably never know for sure. I think the lesson here is uh, just get a regular dog. I don't know what a raccoon dog is, but <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I, I, I I like breeding a raccoon and a dog is you know sounds like a good way of getting a pandemic too. Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I also think. Americans, we just kind of like conspiracy theories. Like how much of the country likes QAnon? I mean, I'm not calling the lab leak a conspiracy theory. I'm just saying, like, we're not a big fan of. Well, Occam's some of razor. it is like the biological weapons. Right, species right. Conspiracy we're, we're just. We're, I think as a as a public, we would rather think that like Area 51 is where there's aliens than like some lame military base. Yeah. Well, and you know the lab leak thing played into in this country. I think also the distrust of like Fauci and mm -hmm. science, right? Because People didn't like scientists, so yep. they didn't like labs, <laughs> and, you know, or that Fauci supported funding for labs like this, and so it got tied up in our own psychosis. But, but yeah, like we do like a good conspiracy theory, and maybe because you know, um, uh, maybe because there are things in the past that I don't know. The truth is out there. That's very true. Yeah. The truth is out there. Excited yeah. to keep talking about this until twenty fifty. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, you'll hear my conversation with uh, Meza Mohammed. Uh, about her work as a reporter in Ethiopia. So stick around for that. My guest today is Maza Mohammed. She is an Ethiopian journalist, uh, advocate, and the founder of Roha TV, which is a independent YouTube-based news channel. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Los Angeles. Thank you so much for having me. So let, let's just start with your, your news channel. Why did you start an independent news channel? What kinds of stories do you focus on? Yeah, my new YouTube channel, actually, uh, I, I, previously I was working as an employee in different news stations. I was a teacher, too. Uh, meanwhile, in our country, all medias are under the broadcast uh, authority. So you cannot have your own independent news, independent mm -hmm. reporters, so that you cannot do what, what you like to do. You are doing what you are supposed to do. The state, sort yeah. of state-owned media. Yeah. So, what I am planning is just to have our independent news center, news media, to make reporters, to 
put political opinions and to advocate for human rights. So uh, the platform that was easier for me was the YouTube platform. Actually, after we start our YouTube platform, again, the government started to put a registration for the YouTube channel. Also, we right. have to be registered under the broadcast authority again, but uh, still it is a good platform in order to use what you want to do. Yeah, I, w I wanted to ask you about that because I saw that in February, the Ethiopian government blocked access to a bunch yeah. of social media sites, Facebook, TikTok, uh, YouTube, I believe. Why did they do that? And, and how? what has that meant for people's ability to get news? Actually, it, it's normal in Ethiopia, you know, to block internets whenever there is a conflict, mm -hmm. whenever there is a kind of uh, uh, situations which the government think that's not comfortable for them. If you know, they have a, a kind of violence, things they start to block everything. They start to arrest journalists, activists. The thing in February was uh, there was a kind of uh, disagreement with the Christian Orthodox Church, so people were uh, again that and then the even the Orthodox Church called for demonstration, a huge demonstration mm. all over the country. So what the government did is shut up the whole uh, the internet connections and wow. then uh, arresting different journalists, um, media closing media, even activists were in prison. Still, there are many activists who are in prison due to that case. So whenever there's something happening in the country, we know that internet will be closed. Right. So we, we try to look some other opportunities like using VPNs and something like that. Right. We are almost adopting that. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are, you guys are nimble. Yeah. Um, I, I know that you, some of your colleagues, other journalists you just mentioned have been arrested or detained by the police. What was their reasoning behind harassing you? Yeah, the thing that we've been arrested, the reason is actually that, as I told you, if there's something happen in the country, they know that if we are not under our arrest, we, we, we will work for the people. We will mm -hmm. write independent news. Uh, we, we will advocate what's right for we think that so they just put uh, the thing for the first time I was arrested by Abiy Ahmed administration was under the command post. We had a kind of state of emergency during the war. So at that time, uh, they charge. Actually, there was no charging because it is under state of emergency. They just put you in the jail and then they forget you. That's wow. what happened to me. No court, no charges. Yeah, they take to me to the prison and then they put me for 40 days. 40 uh, days? 40 days, yes. 40 days for theirs. Then uh, they leave me alone. There is no going to court. There is no charge. There is nothing that happened to me. But they were accusing me for working with TPLF, which won't happen. Uh, working with TPLF and... Uh, you know, working against the EU, working with the enemies of the country and something like that. So I was in prison with a lot of Tigrayans who were under uh, uh, the command post prison. That was happened to be at that time. There was also a conflict in Amhara regional state. So we don't know what's the connection. I live in the capital city, mm -hmm. but the thing was happening in the uh, Amhara regional state. And then again, they put me in prison because they, they said she's working with those making the violence. Because what we are doing is we advocate what people are asking. We write reporters what people are trying to ask, what the demonstration says. So they don't want to be listened. They think the government thinks that silencing journalists is silencing the people mm -hmm. that, that, that's how it works basically they're saying so we'll, we'll get into the civil war i mean there's been this this civil war happening since i think november of 2020 until november of last year there was a ceasefire yeah. between the ethiopian government and the tplf who are this an organization in the northern tigray region right of ethiopia sort of the former government uh, a lot of former government officials up there and they're basically saying you're working for the other side of the civil war because you're doing reporting yeah, yeah. For your information, the war is not only in Tigray regional state, right, but also uh, it is. It takes place in three regional states: the Afar regional state, the Amhara regional state, and the Tigray regional state. The, 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 we call it the northern, the northern war or the northern conflict. So uh, there are so many. Um, actually, there were the federal government, high official of the federal government, and then after the change has come. They moved to the Tigray regional state, and then the fight is between the Tigray regional states and the, with the federal government. 
me, I always call it the war is the politicians war, not the people. That was why what I am advocating for. I was telling for people, this war is not the issue of the people. Mm -hmm. This war is a conflict between the politicians for the sake of their power, for the sake of their power. That's the only thing that I can say. So this was the thing that the federal government makes um, it against me. And they say it is the issue of national interest. Uh, it is the issue of the people. Mm -hmm. So Maaza is working again at the national interest of her country. So this propaganda was really bad for me. It hurts me. You know, even the people were advocating against me. Yeah, They were asking the government for me to be in prison. Actually, what we have spent, it's not, it's more than my, my, my prison, you know, being in prison uh, three times in a year is simple when you compare it, that losing 500,000 people in a year. Yeah. So uh, it's normal for me because I am living under the worst scenario in my country. So the thing that where they were um, blaming me is that I am saying the war doesn't belong to all people. Mm -hmm. It belongs to the politicians and the politicians have a round table to discuss. Then that's what they are doing. now. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, so I, you mentioned the the death toll of 500,000 people killed in this two-year war. I see the I saw the um, the African Union's peace negotiator said it could have been up to 600,000 people killed in the fighting. On top of that, millions of people have been displaced and driven out of their homes. Um, you know, we've like we're just a little podcast in LA. We've trying to cover this war as much as we can. But as you know better than anybody, um, it's challenging for journalists to get into the region to cover the war. It's challenging to get information out. What do you think people should know about what's happening that hasn't been covered? Yeah, the thing that uh, happening is, the, as I told you earlier, is, is the worst thing because the, the number is, the, it says the reported number, 500,000 is the reported number. So yeah. you can imagine the unreported one, right, you know, right. we, we can imagine. I saw with my eyes, you know, a lot of funerals. I, I saw everything that as much as I can. You know, uh, as a journalist, in order to reporting is from the place, it was very difficult for especially uh, going to the Tigray area because it's already controlled by the regional government. So we cannot uh, go, we, we were not able to go there and to cover the news. But I tried to move to Afar and Amhara, which was under the control of the federal government so that I can have uh, so many interviews with the victims. I can have uh, so many videos, how things were missed, how things were destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, we lost so many lives. I had an interview with women and children who were victim of the war. Uh, not only the war, but also uh, the, they were victim of sex sexually victimed. They were raped by soldiers and I interviewed them. They are, they are in a series of problem, you know, still they are under refugee centers. They are living in counter refugee camps. So the thing for the reporters is you can now go and see. So we get, especially the situation in Tigray, we get information from the international communities mm -hmm. that, that they have a possibilities. So we, we were not able to see what's happening. And still, we are not able, still after the negotiation is going on, journalists, human rights activists, they cannot go there and see what's happening. There is no also external investigation in both Amhara and uh, Tigray regional states. Yeah. We need an external investigation. We need accountability for war crimes. But in order to do this, we need to have someone or some group to have external investigation on right. both regional states. Yeah. Well, you know, so so I'm glad you brought that up because Tony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, was in Ethiopia a couple days ago. Yeah. We're filming this on Friday, March uh, 17th. He called for accountability for atrocities committed during the war. I'm wondering, like, what do you think accountability for these war crimes would look like? What needs to happen? I I, I appreciate that, but I don't think it, it, it works easily. You know, what's happening there is under the under both governments, the federal and the regional governments are accountable for it. You know, mm -hmm. whatever it takes, they are the one who is leading the war. 
the federal government and again the regional government in Tigray. Mm -hmm. So both of them are they're responsible for what's happening there, for the crimes as a leader, as a participant of the war. And the negotiation, the peace negotiation is again between them in order to keep their power. Mm -hmm. You know what? The peace agreement for me, it is because they cannot go more. They did it because not they can't go more. Because we have been advocating this from the very beginning to sit down and to solve their problems. The issue is politics. The mm -hmm. issue is power. So that sit down and discuss before the war. They fought for two years. They killed everyone. They destroy everything. They put us back to 30 years. And then finally, they know that they cannot go beyond this. They cannot win each other. Mm -hmm. So they come and sit down. So they talk. Uh, I also noticed that Tony said, uh, here's a quote, for our part, the United States acknowledges human rights violations and repression committed during the past few decades, actions which sowed the seeds of future conflict. We and others were insufficiently vocal about these abuses in the past is there a sense of frustration uh, among the Ethiopian people that the United States or other Western countries were silent about previous abuses that maybe sort of led to the conflict that's been happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, myself also had uh, frustrated about it. You know, the thing is not only about the northern issue. In yeah. my country, there is also a serious problem, especially in the eastern part of Ethiopia, which is Oromia regional state. People are under the threat of ethnic cleansing. People are under the threat of genocide. The Amhara people are under the threat of genocide. People are killed every day. A bunch of people are dying, are killed because of their ethnicity, because who they are. Right now, 1.2 million people are displaced from the Oromia regional states. 1.2 Amharas are displaced from a regional states. So I don't know why the people, the community, Keep silent, especially the international community, the Westerners, the U.S. government. Even Anthony Blinken, he doesn't mention anything in his stay. I have a about question. the treatment of the Amhara. Yeah, people. yeah, because it's not only about the northern conflict that we are frustrated. Mm -hmm. The northern conflict, we appreciate that at least there is a ceasefire. At least people are not dying right now. Yeah. At least people are not displaced right now. But in the eastern part. Is there is a state-sponsored genocide, I can say this way, because people are killed because of who they are. There's no any reason back. And they officially said, those the rebelling groups, the OLA group, they said, they have to leave our place. If not, we will clean them. This is the, with the sentence that already they put. So we need the international community to interfere here. We need to speak out. Mm -hmm. You know, anywhere, anywhere, injustices everywhere. Right. The, the 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 sort of, I think the most um, the biggest action the United States has taken was to expel Ethiopia from the African Growth and Opportunity Act trade agreement. Uh, I think in 2021 yeah. as a way to punish the government for human rights abuses. Do you think that had an impact on, on Abi's thinking, decision making? Yeah. If there is, you know, this is. The 21st century so we, we may we need to work with the international community we need to work with the globe especially as a third world as a poor country we don't have a place to live alone we don't we cannot do that we, we are looking for different um help us we are we are looking for different budgets so as a government of Ethiopia, there's it's a pressure it's a big pressure and i really appreciate that because we need to do this Again, a dictator government like Abi Ahmed, you know, he the one who is putting the people of Ethiopia under this situation. After his leadership came in Ethiopia, we are lo losing so many people due to their ethnic identity, due to war conflicts, due to even unknown reasons. We are. We have. You know. We have an issue of survival. Mm -hmm. Previously, we had a question of democracy, or something. It, it becomes luxury for us asking for your democratic right and something like that. It's a luxury for Ethiopians. We right. are under the question of survival issue. So the world needs to put a pressure. So it's one thing that makes a pressure, and then that makes them to sit down and talk. 
who else could help with the, that pressure? Is like the African Union. I mean, I think the United States, I think a lot of European countries need to be very thoughtful and careful about telling uh, countries in Africa what to do or how to act or pushing for democracy, right? So I'm just wondering where you think the appropriate pressure should come from. Yeah, the first one is the United States, obviously, and then they are doing their best, but we need more. We need more in different perspectives, not only in the issue of the northern conflict. Okay. At, at, at all level, because all are our threats as a, as, a, as a community. The other thing, the European Union, the United Nations, and also different human rights advocates, they have to be concerned about it. And we need their voice for our people so that the world dominators they can hear. Mm -hmm. Because we are the only who are speaking and crying and shouting again and again. Genocide, war, conflict, we're, we're the ones. So we need those communities who work for people, just who works for human beings. We need to, their voices so that we can be heard under those who are there to hear. Right. Just lift them up. Um, I think the uh, Prime Minister Abi was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019 for his work to resolve Ethiopia's uh, border dispute with Eritrea. He later partnered with Eritrean forces to attack forces in the Tigray region, kicking off this this war. What did the Western world miss about Abiy to get him so wrong that they could offer this man a Nobel Peace Prize a year before you know launching this war? Yeah, the thing that, you know, from the very beginning, I, I had a question. Personally, I had a question and I face a lot of uh, hates. I face a lot of insults because I was asking the people, I was asking the world, those who even give him the prize, what did you see? What did he do? What, did, what the thing that makes you to believe in Abiy Ahmed? We believe him just because he's new. And or most of the people, because they hate TPLF, because they don't want to, they, we were fighting and um, struggling again as the TPLF. It was one of the dictator governments. Mm -hmm. So it just because we were struggling and hating the TPLF cannot make Abiy Ahmed correct. We have to see him what he's going to do. So the situation between Eritrea and Ethiopia also, my question, what was the peace agreement? Why we were not signing, why we were not together, and then what's happening new? It, it, it was a kind of honeymoon between Abiy Ahmed and um, mm -hmm. uh, Isaias. It, it, it seems like that for me. I was asking that. I don't know how the international community puts the trust or those who prize him. I don't know how they see it. That was my question too. And the wallet, the one who gives the prize and seeing what's happening there. And you will see worse. Like, yeah, I, I can. I, I, I assure you, between these two countries and between these two leaders, mm -hmm. there is something we will hear and see in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like they needed um, more independent media reporting on the facts and the reality. Yeah, we need. So, well, so last question. I mean, I think a lot of people are listening to this, and I think you know they hear a lot about. Uh, I don't mean to compare the two, but they hear a lot about Ukraine and the fighting, and there are, I think, clear ways to help people that were displaced from Ukraine or refugees or the United States is giving weapons. What do you think like uh, the average listener or sort of citizen in the U.S. can do to either raise awareness about what's happening in Ethiopia or actually help people on the ground? Yeah, I can see that a lot of Americans, uh, including uh, the State Department and everywhere you see, they have a good knowledge, they have a good heart for the situation in Ukraine, that's I appreciate, that's, that's what I appreciate. But, and I see a lot of people doesn't know anything about Ethiopians who are suffering there uh, for both uh, the political and the ethnic issues. You know, we have so many people displaced. We have, we are losing so many people due to the civil war. And again, the worst thing is happening now right now a lot of people are dying because of who they are especially with the oromia regional state mm -hmm. and in which the government bodies are participating in it i can say this boldly the government especially the oromia regional government is the one acting on amhara genocide which is continuous 
in Horomia Regional State. So we need the American people, the human rights advocates, the state department, the government officials to focus on it and then to be voice for them at least at the minimum cost. Well, thank you so much for being here and, and helping us understand this better and raising awareness. Where can people find your work? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me again. People can find my work in my YouTube channel, Roja TV. And also uh, we have a, a TikTok, we have uh, websites there, and then we have also Facebook and Instagram pages that, that you can follow and share the news that we are Okay, having. great. Well, everyone check it out. And thank you again for coming. Thank you so much. Thanks again to Max and uh, Mirza Mohammed for joining the show. Uh, it's going to be very funny when this comes out and then they don't arrest Trump ever and it was all just made up on True Social. Yeah. I, like, I still have like mixed feelings about the, the porn star being the, the lead arrest uh, of the state. And not January 6th. Uh, and not like the violent insurrection, but, you know, it'd still be, you know, high, high entertainment value. You, you um, know who's uh, excited about this? Cable news. A lot of content. Yeah, cable news shows. This will create a lot of content. Nonstop. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, all right, we'll talk to you guys next week.